On the 15th of February 1942, the Allied convoy, carrying reinforcement for the much-needed defender at Timor Island, departed Darwin to the island, through the Timor Sea. However, a Japanese flying boat suddenly appears and shadowing them. The crew, aboard the convoy were shock. They had taken a precaution before, and followed the route that was presumed to be safe from air attack. The Japanese aircraft were not supposed to be here, they thought. Their presence here can only mean one thing. What happened next is the battle on the air, and on the sea, between the Allied convoy, and the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Flotilla. This, is their story, the forgotten, Timor convoy. Timor, is an island at the southern end of Southeast Asia, north of the Timor Sea. Prior to the invasion, Timor was garrisoned by 650 KNIL troops, and 1,500 Australian Army of the Sparrow Force, center on 2nd 48th Battalion, from the 23rd Brigade of the AIF 8th Division. These force mainly concentrated at Kupang, on Dutch Timor. The Allied know the island was a target by the Japanese, since it airfield was vital, but the question was when, and how the Japanese would attack. On the 26th of January 1942, seven Japanese A6M20 fighters appeared over Timor for the first time. Some Allied aircraft were destroyed on the ground, while a Dutch civilian Drum and Goose amphibian was shot down. After the first strike by Japanese on Timor, the Abdecom Supreme Commander, General Wavell, had decided on 27 January that Timor was threatened. Its airfield was essential, since short-range aircraft could not reach Java from Australia without refueling, after the flight over the Timor Sea. Timor Island needed to be defended, if Java was to have any hope of surviving. To help defend against the Japanese air attack, Wavell ordered an anti-aircraft battery from Java to Timor. This was a British veteran unit, the 79th Light Anti-Aircraft Battery with six modern Bofors guns. But along with the few hundred lightly equipped Dutch soldiers who augmented Sparrow Force, more men and equipment were needed. To ensure the defense of the vital Penfui airfield against the anticipation of Japanese assault, Wavell then requests the Australian government to move a battalion from Port Darwin, while the Americans agreed to send an artillery regiment, the U.S. Army of 148th Field Artillery Regiment, consisted of 500 men, stationed on Port Darwin. Initially, the Australian government was reluctant to weaken the Darwin garrison, but on the advice of the Chiefs of Staff, on 5 February, they agreed to reinforce Timor with the 2nd 4th Pioneer Battalion, consisted of 1,000 troops. Combined with the British anti-aircraft unit, Timor would, on paper, have a significant near-brigade-sized defense force. However, the problem was getting the reinforcements to their destination, although it was only two days sailing from Darwin. To transport the reinforcement force to Timor from Darwin, the three main transport ships were selected. These are the American freighters, USAT Meigs, USAT Manaloa, and SS Port Ma. All had been transporting supplies from the USA to the Philippines when the Pacific War broke out, and all had instead been diverted to Australia. Also selected for the Timor convoy was the MV Tulagi, a small but modern British merchant's vessel, built in 1939, to be used as a transport ship. Escorting the convoy was the US Navy heavy cruiser, the USS Houston. The cruiser, capable of accelerating at 33 knots, and was equipped with four 5-inch anti-aircraft guns. Two modern Royal Australian Navy sloops, HMAS Swan, and HMAS Warrego, were selected for the convoy. 
Both were armed with three QF 4-inch guns on high-angle mounts for anti-aircraft use. The final escort was the U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Peary. However, Peary was lack of anti-aircraft defenses. She just relying on a single obsolete three-inch anti-aircraft gun, and her machine guns. The team or convoy was entrusted to an experienced and competent escort force, each of which had already encountered the Japanese, before to this mission. This was important as the convoy would be virtually without air cover. The only air cover that available on the day of operation, was the survival from U.S. Army Air Force of 3rd Provisional Pursuit Squadron with two Curtis P-40 Warhawks, and 33rd Provisional Pursuit Squadron with 10 Warhawks. Both of squadron was stationed at RAAF station at Darwin, and was formed to bolster the Allied air power in the Java. While the decision to reinforce Timor with the troops was made in early February, a number of factors combined to delay the convoy. The shipping would not be available until 15 February, even though all four transport ships had been in Darwin for some time, due to unfortunate circumstances at Darwin. Prior to the invasion of Timor, the IJN Southern Task Force Commander, Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, had instructed naval land-based reconnaissance aircrafts and bombers, from the IJN 21st Air Flotilla, to search, and to neutralize, for any Allied convoy or vessel, that might be leaving Darwin to reinforce Timor and Java in the Arafura and Timor Sea. Their objective was to prevent the Allied from reinforcing their force at Timor and Java, and to clear the sailing route in the area, ahead of the carrier task force, the IJN First Air Fleet, under the command of Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. The carrier task force was tasked to cover the invasion landing on Timor, by conducted a major raid on Darwin. The IJN 21st Air Flotilla, under the command of the IJN 11th Air Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Nishizo Sukohara, consisted of four air groups. These were the 1st Air Group, Toko Air Group, Kanoya Air Group, and 1001 Air Group. The 1001 Air Group was a paratrooper unit, and therefore was not involved in this operation. The Toko Air Group was a reconnaissance unit, operating at Hambon, and was equipped with long-range aircraft, Kawanishi, H-6K, Mavis flying boats. The 1st Air Group, and the Kanoya Air Group, were the bomber groups. The 1st Air Group was consisted of Mitsubishi G-3 M0 medium bombers, operating at Kendari, and was due to move its group to Ambon, while the Kanoya Air Groups, consisted of modern Mitsubishi G-4M Betty medium bombers, was operating at Kendari. On the 15th of February, four transport ship, carrying U.S. Army of the 148th Field Artillery, and Australian troops of the 2nd 4th Pioneer Battalion, left Darwin under cover of darkness at 2 o'clock, and headed southwest. It was not the most direct route to Timor, but it was hoped that this route would avoid Japanese reconnaissance aircraft, before the convoy turned north. On the same day, three long large four-engine Mavis flying boats, from Toko Air Group, took off from Ambon at 6.26, for a patrol over the Arafura and Timor Sea. One of the Mavis flying boat, commanded by Sub-Lieutenant Mirau, sighted the convoy just after 10.30 that morning. As the Mavis flying boat found the convoy, Mirau reported the finding to Ambon, and were instructed to stay out of gun range, and keep the convoy in sight. Later, the IJN 21st Air Flotilla Commander, launched two G3M Nell medium bombers of the 1st Air Group from Kendari, to probe the spotted convoy. Meanwhile, Captain Rooks, commander of the USS Houston, immediately signaled Darwin for air cover. His request was answered by the RAAF Station Commander, Wing Commander Sturt Griffith. 
Griffith then ordered the only available aircraft at his disposal, to fly out and intercept the Japanese aircraft. Only two aircraft were available on Darwin, both were on patrol at that time. Of these two aircrafts, only a single P-40 Warhawk, piloted by Lieutenant Robert J. Buell, a survivor of the USAAF 3rd Pursuit Squadron, can be contacted, while the other one out of contact. He was directed to make an overwater flight, to find the convoy some 200 kilometers away. At around 1400 hours, with the Mavis low on fuel, and ready to return to Ambon, the flying boat came in on a bombing run on USS Houston. But heavy anti-aircraft fire from the escorts kept the flying boat high. And its bombs did no damage. As the Mavis turned for a second attack, a lone P-40 Warhawk from Darwin appeared. But the pilot could not find the Mavis, as the Japanese flying boat hidden in the cloud, and the Houston could not communicate with him, or tell him where the Mavis was. Houston then fired several 5-inch salvos in the vicinity of the Japanese aircraft, but went unnoticed by Bu. The Mavis then went on its second bombing run, which was again cut off by the Houston 5-inch guns. Again, the bombs fell into the sea. The Mavis then fled, and the Warhawk finally on its heels. Buell then followed the Mavis, into a cloud bank. In his first pass, Buell killed the Mavis radio operator, and set the forward fuel tank afire. In return, the Japanese gunners also managed to cripple Buell's P-40, and the burning Warhawk dove into the sea and exploded, killing its pilot. The pilot of the crippled Mavis managed to ditch in the sea, as flames quickly spread throughout the fuselage. Mirau was among those killed, but a few of the crew survived, and managed to reach Melville Island. At that time, neither side knew what had happened to their respective aircraft. Both planes went down without sending a final report. Although the convoy was now safe from the Mavis flying boat, the convoy had been spotted, and its operation was known to the Japanese. On Darwin, 10 P-40 Warhawks of the U.S. Army Air Force 33rd Pursuit Squadron, under command of Major Pell, arrived on RAAF station, and immediately ordered to provide air cover for the convoy. Late that afternoon, Major Pell led some of these aircraft to cover the convoy, and there was no Japanese aircraft present. At 1925, after P-40's Warhawks had departed, two G-3ML bombers of the 1st Air Group, that departed from Kendari earlier, found the convoy, but reported that it was too late to attack due to darkness. By the morning of the 16th of February, Houston's convoy was crossing the team of sea, and almost beyond the combat radius of the Darwin-based fighters. However, at dawn, Major Pell, of USAAF 33rd Pursuit Squadron, led a wingman far out into the Timor Sea and located the convoy, now just 150 kilometers short of Timor. However, the limited range of the P-40s meant they could not stay long, and they soon turned for home. At 9.15, another Mavis flying boat from the IJN Toko Air Group, appeared to shadow the convoy. Circling lazily out of gun range, she was keeping contact for the airstrike that followed two hours later. At Kendari, 35 G3 M Nell bombers from the IJN First Air Group, had been launched. They were joined by nine more Mavis flying boats from the IJN Toko Air Group, operating at Ambon. At 11 o'clock, the Japanese bombers approached in waves at high altitude. Only Houston's 5-inch guns could reach them, taking Peary, Warrego, and Swan out of the fight. Houston moved to the north of the convoy, trying to protect the helpless transports by drawing the attention of the bombers. And it succeeded, almost all the bombers targeted the cruiser, and not the transports. 
35 G3M Nell bombers attacked in V formations, and mainly concentrating on the Houston. However, Houston put up an aggressive barrage. Some 935 inch shells were fired over a lengthy 45 minutes engagement time. This was an impressive ongoing barrage, which succeeded in keeping the Japanese bombers too high to be effective. Several attack runs were made, and sticks of bombs fell around Houston. Meanwhile, the transport ships were not gone unnoticed. Nine Mavis flying boats approached from the southwest of the convoy. Aside from making smoke, the merchant ships lacked any defense of their own against high-level attackers. They relied entirely on the high-angle 4-inch guns of the two Australian sloops, Swan and Warrigo, which fired constantly during the action. The convoy had scattered, and each vessel sought protection by maneuvering the best they could. Bombs fell close to the three larger transport ships. Port Mar reported 23 bombs landing within 50 meters. The Mauna Loa received a near miss that injured three, one mortally, but no direct hits. The Japanese believed they had hit two of the transports, and recorded some near misses, but overall admitted they could not inflict much damage. Twelve Japanese aircraft suffered damage but none were shot down. By 1234, the attack was ended, and the partly scattered convoy began to reassemble. The army commander aboard Meeks signaled Houston for her bravery defense, exceedingly well done. The convoy continued on their journey to Timor. However, at 1550, Abdecom headquarters ordered the convoy to turn back to Darwin. With the invasion of Timor imminent, Abdecom Supreme Commander, General Archibald Wavell, feared the Japanese carrier force and a support fleet, lying in wait in the area to cover the landings. With their cover unavailable from Darwin or Timor, he was unwilling to expose the convoy to further attacks. This was the cause of much relief, for the crew on board the convoy, but they remained vulnerable, until they could get back safely to the Australian port and disembark. In fact, the Allied convoy had dodged a bigger bullet than it knew. The attack which did eventuate that day, was only about half the size intended. An additional force of 27 Mitsubishi G4M bombers from the Kano Yar Air Group was also launched to attack the convoy, but failed to find it and returned to base. As well as having modern G4M Betty medium bombers, this unit had participated in the sinking of Royal Navy battleship HMS Prince of Wales and battle cruiser HMS Repulse. On that occasion, it attacked with torpedoes. The convoy had been very lucky to avoid a concerted attack by this experienced unit, especially with anti-aircraft ammunition virtually exhausted. On 17 February, another powerful attack force was again launched to find the convoy in the vicinity of Kupang. This force comprised of four Toko Air Group flying boats, 26 First Air Group G3M bombers, and 19 Kano Yair Air Group G4M bombers. However, they failed to find the convoy who were already left, and attacked a secondary target of a defensive battery, near Kupang. Meanwhile, the convoy made contact with the Allied aircraft, this time, RAAF Hudson's, which would help provide air cover into Darwin. Three of these twin-engined light bombers, had been forward deployed to the remote western Australian airfield of Drysdale, for this task. Soon after dawn on the 18th of February, a P-40 patrol located the convoy some 100 kilometers out, and escorted them towards Darwin without incident.
There was much relief among the crews, as the convoy passed back through the boom gate that morning. But no wharf access was available. The ships anchored in the harbor, with the heavy equipment and supplies still embarked. Small ships and boats were used to disembark the troops from Mauna Loa, and Meeks. But hundreds of men remained aboard Port Mar and Tilagi. They would spend another night, on board the two crowded transports. The Houston, and the Perry, then were ordered to leave Darwin, and joined the Rear Admiral Dorman Strike Force at Chila Chap. After a Japanese invasion convoy for Bali had been sighted on Makassar Strait. However, Peary fatefully returned to Darwin Harbor early on the 19th of February, in order to refuel, after the nighttime search for the submarine was unsuccessful. The refueling took longer than expected, and USS Perry Commander, Lieutenant Commander Keith, decided to remain at Darwin overnight, and sail for Java on the next morning. Little did they know, what would happen to them later that morning. Three of these Timor convoy ships would be sunk, thousands would lose their life, while other ships on the harbor were destroyed and badly damaged, when 188 bombers and fighters, from the Imperial Japanese Navy, attacked Darwin, in the infamous event known as, the Bombing, of Darwin.